Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Lauren James. I am a, an author. My main job is to write really commercial books that sell copies. I've written uh, six books, with many of which are in development or under option with, in, with production companies in LA. I also work in a TV writer's room as a script consultant, so I do lots of work in different kinds of writing, and I'm really focused on helping writers make their stories better. Um, a lot of the work I do with universities is about uh, improving how you tell stories about science. And through that, I set up my own group of um, other authors so I can like help connect with more people. But my, a bit about me and my background, I studied chemistry and physics at university, and when I was studying, I was just a big reader, uh, and I started writing my own book, and I got a book deal before I graduated, and I had been planning to go in and study science, and I instead was like, I'll take a gap year and see if I can make writing work, and I have been on that gap year ever since, <laughs> and it's been a, a, a long time now, six years. Um, so. Uh, I, a big focus for me since the beginning of my career has been about telling stories about science and getting inspiration from the things I was studying and showing science as something that's relatable and approachable and exciting because I love talking about it and I know a lot of kids find it really intimidating and maybe they don't think they're clever enough to study science and I don't think that's true. So I, uh, it's always been a focus for me. Uh, and then... I started thinking about climate change for one of my uh, novels because from the beginning of my career I wanted to write a book about climate change. It's such a big important topic that I learned a lot about at university but I couldn't find a way in because I try to write really fun, exciting, entertaining stories and it's such a depressing topic that I didn't want to write a book where I was just going to have a horrible time writing it for a year and then it would be really miserable to read. Uh, so I was thinking about it for a long time, and then I came up with an idea of what if um, teenagers have magical powers that allow them to grow plants, and they use these plants to take control of the planet and do a heist to rewild Earth and uh, hold a lot of the companies and the people that are holding back climate change progress to account. And this was inspired hugely by the movements like Extinction Rebellion and the school strikes where teenagers um, are very willing to do acts of civil disobedience because they're so angry about climate change what if they actually had the power to do something and they were willing to break the law to make it happen so in my book my characters can grow plants and they use this to work together to do things like um, create massive nets of seaweed that pull the plastic out of the ocean turn that plastic into a giant island and then plant wind turbines on it they take hold of the international space station and reforest continents and do all of these crazy things which probably they would get in a lot of trouble for if it wasn't fiction um, but um, they have a, a lot of fun and it showcases a lot of things about climate change which people don't necessarily know about through a cool story about kids with superpowers. So when I was writing it, I want, was, a big part of my writing process is reading as much as possible around the area that I'm writing about and learning from what other people are doing. And I found it really difficult with climate change fiction. Uh, you were saying that when you search for eco-fiction, there's not much out there. There's not many resources. Um, so I decided to create a database where people could find and track what is being published in climate change. And this was inspired hugely by a uh, organization from 1908 called the Women Writers Suffrage League, which was set up to encourage writers and authors uh, to create books with a message of women should have the vote as a way to get that message out there and encourage the suffrage movement. And I thought that if there's anything that is going to be comparable to the suffragettes, it's now climate change. In 100 years, we're going to be looking back and questioning whether we should have been doing more violent, uh, in, in, civil disobedient acts to progress the climate battle in the way that we now talk about the suffragettes of 1908. So I set up a group, it's, um, there's now 150 members of traditionally published authors, which means that they're not self-published, they've got book deals with publishers who've written books focusing on climate change from all across the planet, and I represent them and their interests. Uh, I get lots of contacts with people who are looking for authors who I can help find the right people to work with, which is how I know Denise. Uh, I've also started through this consulting with production companies on their stories they're telling about the environment. I've also helped museums who are setting up uh, climate programming in the future. Uh, I'm working on an anthology of positive stories about the future which represent a world where we've put solutions in place. I'm part of the Society of Authors, Authors Sustainability Committee, which is um, a group of authors who are 
preparing questions to ask their publishers about what are you doing to bring up the standard of quality of your books to make sure they're as environmentally friendly as possible. And we want to have that written on the copyright page of every book so that readers can compare and contrast what they're buying. Uh, and I also have been involved in lots of pitching uh, things with Hollywood production companies who are actively looking for climate stories and um, working with them on ways to make that happen and provide resources to them. So through something that I just set up for myself as when I was writing to provide a resource of lots of books, it's actually led to all of these amazing opportunities to work with people because I found out that people are desperate for someone who knows stuff about climate change and who is willing to talk to them about it because it's something we all know about and we know the basics of, but it takes a lot of time investment in researching and reading to learn the things that are very on the cutting edge front of the battle and that's what I'm trying to be is someone who can like provide the information that people need. So from like my work in kind of gathering all of the knowledge and um, I wanted to talk about some of the things that I see a lot in climate fiction. Uh, so to start with, when I first set this up, most of the books we were working with were um, five or ten years old. In the last year, there has been a big push to publish more climate fiction. Our numbers are increasing, which is great. But uh, most of the stuff that is being published by traditional publishers is very overwhelmingly dystopian. It's set in the future where things have gone wrong, and it's about people trying to survive. So it does have a message of climate change is bad, but it doesn't really tell you how you can fix it, and it's just very depressing to read. Uh, I found that there are a lot of books which are about political activism, but they tend to be middle grade, which means they're written for children in primary school. Uh, and it will tend to be a story, that I, the trope that I see a lot is, uh, a kid notices their school isn't recycling, so they run a campaign to become the student body president and get recycling put into place. Uh, and this has got a great message of you can do something politically to help climate change. Uh, but we don't see, I don't see that for older readers or adult re readers. It's kind of something that is aimed solely at children. I've also noticed from working with authors around the world that a lot of the books published by UK and Australian publishers tend to be very politically ac active and have these messages of calling out um, companies. But um, books by American publishers don't. They're very neutral. They're very careful and reserved in the messaging they're, they're saying. Um, I also think that um, books, if they aren't dystopian, if they are contemporary books set in the present day about climate change, they do tend to have a lot of messaging about individual action, blaming people for their emissions, and they don't really say anything about uh, industry and all the economics and politics of what is holding back climate progress. And I think that this is bad because people aren't really going to engage with a book if they're reading it and being told they should be recycling. Uh, they're either going to be frustrated that they already are or they're just going to uh, put the book down. So the, the, the great thing that I do see a lot is there is positive messaging about um, connecting to nature. That's a really big thing is like uh, connecting the... Um, the activism journey with wanting more natural love and um, but it doesn't really tend to progress beyond that uh, in terms of like how else we can think positively about climate change and I find that a lot of the stuff the stories that I see tend to be focused on the UK or America if they do mention any of the activism going on uh, most of the countries affected by climate change are outside of the the ones that we know of and the biggest countries and they have amazing groups of activists who aren't reported on in the newspaper in favor of the big names that we know of and so I'd love to see more of that and a big thing that ties into what Denise was talking about with positive messaging is that when you do have stories which represent maybe um, the kind of more dark side of climate change, it tends to be very binary in that you have good people or bad people. And if they are good, they will recycle. And if they are bad, they will not. Um, I think it, there's a lot of room to um, show that with more nuance because people don't think of themselves as evil in general. Like there are polluters out there, but they think they're good people. If someone who is a CEO of an oil company thinks that they are a community builder, that they are providing jobs, they are providing access to electricity to people who would not always have it otherwise. Like they think of themselves as a good person. 
And I think that's the kind of thing we need to see more in fiction, is showing both sides of the debate so that you can show someone's perspective and then tell them why they're wrong. And I'm not seeing that a lot yet in the books about climate change. So, um, I wanted to talk a bit about some of the things that I want to see more of. Uh, so the big thing that I want to uh, see is more solutions in books because as this Onion satire piece from 2014 says, scientists politely remind the world that clean energy technology is ready to go whenever. Like we know how to fix this, it's not going to require any massive leaps in technology, it's not like futuristic stuff, it's all very basic boring things like setting up wind turbines. It's just about making it happen. And we know that if you don't see these solutions, that you think that there's this perceived solutions gap where they don't exist. And so it's really important in fiction to show these things in action so that we can visualize the future we're working towards and so that uh, people can see what they have to do, not only in their own lives, but as a society. Uh, when they're making decisions about where their money goes, who they vote for, they know what they're aiming towards. So, um, the case for positivity as I see it. Firstly, um, if you're reading boring, like, uh, depressing books about a dystopian world, you're not really going to be inspired to do much more than feel sad for a bit. If you're reading books that show an amazing green world where we're living in cities with green vertical farm skyscrapers alongside the London landscape, that's going to really inspire you to work towards that optimistic future. And it's going to make you uh, feel like you can make that happen. Uh, we don't want to panic people, and as writers, I, I think that everyone is going to feel angry and frustrated when they are writing about climate change, but you want to use that as a drive to create a positive book. And don't write an angry book using your anger. And I think that you should so show that climate change is solvable, and it is something that is happening both long-term and right now, and there are things that we can do to, that aren't happening to fix it. So some more things that I would like to see uh, that came up when I was researching my own book, Green Rising. Um, a lot of something that I hadn't really heard much about was climate denial. And I think this is a hugely important topic that we need to know more about. Because I remember when I was in primary school, um, I was like taught about the greenhouse effect, and then I was told what the solutions are, and they're the same solutions that we have now. And I remember being like, oh, so it's, it's happening then. This will be fixed by the time I'm grown up. The adults are dealing with it. And it, then it hasn't happened. And there is a reason for that. It's not that those things are difficult to do. It's that there are companies that are actively trying to slow down the process. So we have here uh, in a document from ExxonMobil from 18, uh, 1989 showing that they are they're planning as a company to make people feel uncertain about whether global uh, warming is happening. We have an ad campaign that they put uh, a lot of money into to say, oh, well, Kentucky is getting colder, so global warming probably isn't real. And they're still doing this today in a lot more insidious ways. So I was recently talking to a climate education specialist, and she said that in America, a lot of schools are very underfunded. And fossil fuel companies will pay for the science department's teacher training and they'll take them away on these amazing expensive days where the teachers are trained in uh, science to do with climate change and to do with oil. And they'll do things like create activities for the kids which really make them excited about fracking. So they'll give them a Twinkie and a syringe and they'll tell the kids to put the syringe in the Twinkie and then pull out the filling and then they get to eat the filling and that's what it's like when you get oil out of the ground. Or they give them a chocolate chip and they get to like take out the chocolate chips and eat them. So they connect the, the oil industry with getting sweets. And it's, it's, they're, they're, thinking, they're committing a lot of money into thinking of ways to bring up the next generation feeling very positive about fossil fuels and not to not believe that climate change is real. And so they're still doing this climate denial now, even if they're not running an ad campaign like this. Another thing that I found out in my research that I would like to see represented more in fiction is um, lawsuits like Juliana versus the United States. This was a lawsuit from 2015, which is still ongoing, where 21 teenagers um, sued the United States government because they said that their affirmative actions to cause climate change have violated the youngest generation's constitutional rights to life, liberty, and property. And we know that a lot of the younger generation feels very anxious about climate change and that they do feel like they've been failed by the adults in their lives. 
And if this lawsuit is successful, I think it's going to be really change the tide in how we think of and message our culture around who is going to fix climate change. Because I still see the message a lot of, oh, all these bright young kids, I can't wait till they grow up and fix the planet. Like, th they shouldn't be the ones fixing it. We need to fix it, and we're responsible to them to fix it. Another thing, uh, geoengineering. Can you put your hand up if you've ever heard the word geoengineering before? Okay, a couple of you. So ideally, everyone should have raised their hand. I had never heard of this, and I studied climate change at university. Geoengineering is the idea that there are ways to fix climate change without changing our emissions. We still keep using the same cars. We still keep burning fossil fuels. But we do things like put a mirror in the space that reflects some of the heat away from the planet or we spray aerosol chemicals into the atmosphere that absorb the uh, carbon dioxide. We scatter iron filings on the sea to encourage algae growth. We pump carbon dioxide into the sea floor. And uh, fossil fuel companies love these ideas because if this happens, they can keep selling their product. So they're really pushing these very space techy, th high tech things. And they're probably not a great idea. I don't think we want to find out what the side effects of these things would be. And I think over the next few decades, this is going to be the big question we're seeing a lot of getting people really excited about geoengineering as a solution. And I think fiction writers need to start saying now, it's not a good idea. Let's maybe think about some of the side effects of doing this. So some of the things that I've learned about how to communicate all of these big scientific topics in stories Firstly, I'm not writing books where I'm teaching a science lecture. I love science, but I don't want to write that. I want to write a fun, exciting story. So as a writer, you're not trying to explain your science. You're just trying to find something that hooks people into the story and use it to create a world that people want to read about or watch. So don't make it too complicated. Look for the thing that interests you or the thing that you have questions about. So geoengineering, what would it be like if we did put a mirror in space and where would that lead us as a society? You don't need to know any of the science about how it works or what those chemicals are that we're going to spray, in, spray into the atmosphere. It's just a great starting point for a story. Another thing uh, is to read around your topic. This is probably obvious, but if you're going to write a book about climate change, you need to read as much as possible, not only books, but also social media, forum debates, so you can see all of the different sides of the argument to, to get into people's heads and find out why deniers deny climate change and how you can address their opinions within the story. And it obviously is a great starting point for character as well. If you've got someone with a very interesting point of view, they're going to be more interesting to read about than someone who just strongly believes climate change is real and we should do something about it. <clears throat> and so something I really find interesting is finding these theories that we've come up with that haven't yet been done. So like geoengineering, the potential for putting a uh, mirror in space. Uh, a big example I like to give is uh, dinosaurs. So we all know Jurassic Park, uh, the image of these kind of reptilian dinosaurs from the 90s. Since then, a lot of science has come back saying that they probably had feathers, and so they would have looked more like this, which would completely change that movie. Uh, but it's really interesting seeing like, how it's kind of captured this moment in time with this theory of what we thought was going on with the science. So I wanted to talk about two different case studies that I think do climate change representation really well. The first one is a book, and the second one is an episode of a TV show. So Becky Chambers is one of my favorite sci-fi writers, and she has written a novel called A Psalm for the Wild Bill, which is about a world where uh, humans have stepped back from nature and left about 60% of the planet to the wild, along with these robots which gained awareness and then took over the nature, but that's not relevant. Um, so they, uh, humans live in very small, green-friendly cities, and the rest of the world is left to nature. Uh, so it's a really great plot that's not, that story that's not really about climate change. It just is in a world where we've done a really good job of living in harmony with nature. So I thought I'd read you a quote. The city was beautiful, it really was, a towering architectural celebration of curves and polish and coloured light, laced with the connective threads of elevated rail lines and smooth footpaths, flocked with leaves that spilled lushly from every balcony and centre divider, each inhaled breath perfumed with cooking spice, fresh nectar, laundry drying in the pristine air. The city was a healthy place, a thriving place, a never-ending harmony of making, doing, growing, trying, laughing, running, living. Sibling Dex was so tired of it. So it's a great example of ways that you can tell a story in a world that highlights all these climate solutions about how we should be living. 
The uh, next one I want to talk about is Ted Lasso, which had an episode in the latest series where one of the players, Sam, realised that the team's kit sponsor, Dubai Air, was owned by an oil company which were refusing to clean up oil spills in his native country of Nigeria. And it's an episode that's very joyful and uplifting. It's focusing on his character growth as he stands up uh, and asks the team to change their sponsor. And it he requires a lot of courage for him and connection with his home culture. I think it's a great example of climate change because it's focused on character, it doesn't shy away from the politics behind climate change as an issue, and it shows some of the ways that we as people can make an actual difference, which mainly does involve finances. It's things like changing a, to a green friendly bank or making sure that your company's pension scheme is not invested in fossil fuels. Uh, it's very relatable and it's a contemporary issue that people can connect to, but it also shows this whole connection going on between different countries' climate issues and how everything is interlinked from Nigeria to Dubai to an English football team. So I wanted to share some resources that I found most useful when I was writing my book and which I've come across through working with production companies. So a few books and podcasts which I really liked, as well as an essay I've written more about this topic, which was published by the Artists, Artists and Writers Yearbook. And then on the right here, I have some links for production guides, which is similar to the Albert Guide in the UK, but done by LA production companies. And then... Lastly, I want to share this link at the bottom right to a spreadsheet done by a climate specialist who her whole job is basically about monitoring the, the climate news and keeping track of activism. And she has been very kind and made the league this spreadsheet, which is, she's continuing to update of all the things that she thinks writers should be looking at on the very forefront of climate activism. Um, and you can click in that and like see all these different categories connected to whatever you're working on and see what she thinks are the very latest things happening that week connected to that topic. So thank you very much. Uh, hopefully that was useful. <laughs>